Something I try to do as I'm testing is to keep each test very isolated and reduce the number of external dependencies it has. But fixtures goes against this idea because it's adding an external data dependency that each test uh, relies strictly on. For example, I have a couple of tests here where I'm checking the user authenticate method. It accepts a username and a password, and then if the password is correct, it should return that matching user. However, if the password is incorrect, it should return nil. And you can see that when I try running the specs, you can see that they both pass. But how are they passing here? You can see in the test that I'm not creating any users to authenticate against. However, I am loading fixtures. And if you check out the user's YAML fixture file here, you can see that that's where that Batman user exists. As you can see, there's a very heavy dependency here between the test and the fixture file. And we can pass or fail a test by just changing the fixture. I don't like making dependencies that are this strong that are so far outside of the test itself. And it gets even worse because the password itself is hashed, so it's not entirely obvious that this happens to match the word secret here to get the test to pass. So let's toss out the fixtures here and instead create a user in line. So I can just create a new user here and we'll give it a username of Batman and a password of secret. And then once we uh, fetch that user, we can pass it in here. And I will also create it down here so that we can ensure that it doesn't fetch it when it's incorrect. You can see when we run the specs though, that they fail. And that is because it says email is invalid because we have additional validations on our user model here. So we can't simply create it inside of our test. So if you check out the user model here, you can see there's an entire list of validations that we need to keep in mind every time we create a user in the spec. And not only that is that if we add validations later on, we have a chance of breaking older specs. So this is where factories come in. Now there are several factory frameworks available for you to use, but my personal preference is factory girl. So that's what I'll show you here, but I'll mention some alternatives at the end of this episode. To install Factory Girl, just add it to your gem file under the test environment, like I am here, called Factory Girl. Now, there is a Factory Girl Rails plugin that you should use if you're in a Rails app, like I am here. And then when you run the bundle command, it will install Factory Girl Rails and the Factory Girl because it's a dependency. Now, there's some excellent documentation inside of the getting started file in the Factory Girl project. And you can see down here that there are several places you can place factories. You can place them in a single factories.rb file or inside of a factories directory, splitting up your factories into multiple files. I prefer the single file, so that's what I'll do here. So let's create a new file here under the spec directory called factories.rb. And in here you call factory girl define and then pass it a block and then pass in factory and a given model name such as user. And it's a good idea to make one for each model you have which is just a simple default containing enough information to make the validations pass. And to get these validations to pass here, we just need to pass in a username, a password, and an email address. Now, if you want to generate dyna uh, data dynamically, what you can do is pass in a block. And this will allow us, for example, here to use the username of the given user here inside of the email address. So that way the email address will match and be set depending on what we set the username to. And so now with that defined, instead of creating a user directly inside of our spec, we can go through factory girl here and say factory girl dot create and pass it the name of the factory that we want to create in this case user. And so we could do the same thing down here as well so that it matches. And now you can see when we run our specs, they both pass again. Yay. So now our tests are nicely isolated and no longer dependent on external fixtures. We do have a problem though, and that is because the username has a validates uniqueness of verification on the user model, that if we try to create multiple users with the factory without specifying the username, then we'll run into problems. For example, let's just create a couple users here, test it out. And this time when the specs are run, you can see that we get a validation error because it says username has already been taken because we have validates uniqueness of on there. So to solve this problem in our factory, we can tell factory girl to use a sequence of numbers to increment and change up our username every time. Now we just pass in a block in here and then the number gets passed in and then we can just add that to our username here so that it mixes it up. 
So this means every user that gets created now will be unique and we no longer get that validation error. Now calling factory girl every time you want to create a factory gets a bit tedious and long. And if you want to shorten it, here's a quick tip. Just go to your spec helper file or test helper if you're using test unit. And then in here, you just need to include a module that factory girl provides called factory syntax methods. This will provide several convenient methods for accessing and creating factories much more quickly. So what this means is that we can remove the call to factory girl entirely and just call create directly in our spec here. And we don't need these couple of lines. And there's a build method available as well if you want to create a model without saving it. Now factory girl also works great across associations. For example, I have this article model here that belongs to a user and notice that it validates the presence of user ID. So we ensure that every article that is created belongs to a user. So we can set up a factory here for this article model and then we just give it a name so it's valid. And we also need to give it a user. And to set that up in Factory Girl is just very easy. All you have to do is call user and it will automatically assign it to a new user instance based off of the factory here. Really neat. Now, if you need to customize this behavior, you can use the association method and then pass in options like specifying which factory to use for the association. Now we can see that association in action by adding a spec that looks like this where we create a new article. And once we do this, it will automatically create a user for us that we can then fetch. And then we can make sure that that user can manage that given article, but it can't manage any other article like that. Now I've already implemented this functionality so you can see that it already passes. Now sometimes there are certain variations on a factory that are very common for you to create. For example, on the user model here, I have an admin column and that's going to default to false. So every user is not going to be an admin. But what if I want to create an admin and not have to pass that admin attribute in every time? In that case, I can make a new factory called admin and then just say admin true. And that will override that attribute and then just every time I create that admin factory, create a user factory, but make admin true. Let me show you how that works by creating a new spec example here. All I do is just pass an admin to create and that will create a user model with that admin attribute set and I want to make sure that it can manage any article but a normal user without admin set cannot manage any normal article. And again, I've already done the implementation on this so you can see when I run the specs, they pass. Now here's a tip. It's a bad habit to use the create method every time because that will actually save the record to the database and oftentimes your test doesn't need that. So you're basically just making an unnecessarily slow test suite. Instead, it's a better idea to always try to use build first and see if that will work for your situation. So it will work here or we can just use build, but certain cases like up here where we do need a user record in the database, we need to, we need to stick with create. Now also be on the lookout for times you can bypass using a factory entirely. For example, right here, we don't really care what attributes this article has and it can just be a simple instance. We can just call article.new and we don't even need to use factory girl. And this will just make things a little bit faster. However, if you find yourself setting attributes on this new instance or saving it to the database, I recommend going back to the factory. Well, that's it for our look at factory girl. Now I haven't covered everything here, so be sure to check out the documentation for more details. Now, if you're looking for an alternative to factory girl, I recommend you check out fabrication. This has a very similar syntax and feature set to factory girl, but it has a few key differences. For example, it does some lazy generation for associations. So if you find yourself working with associations a lot and have a complex association tree where factory girl seems to load too much at one time than you need, then consider fabrication. But whatever the case, both factory solutions are great and you can't go wrong with either one. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.